keynote speaker is a co-founder and executive director of the Sahara Group, a leading international energy, power, oil and gas, and infrastructure conglomerate with operations in over 20 countries across six subcontinental regions. From studying architecture to management and then becoming an active energy sector leader, he's also taken his message of impact and development to the global scene, serving as an active member of the World Economic Forum's Global Advisory Council on Energy, as well as a Partnering Against Corruption Initiative. His passion for youth development and giving back to the less privileged has led to the establishment of the Nehima Youth Empowerment Initiative that has impacted a lot of young people through grants and other activities, including training farmers in northern Nigeria. He sits on the boards of many nonprofit organizations and continues to inspire young people wherever he goes. I think that the founder has already given him a very, very warm welcome. So it's our turn now to celebrate Mr. Toye Ko as he comes forward for his keynote address. Good morning, all. Okay, I didn't hear anybody welcome those who came from Unilag. All right, so I'm representing. Yeah, you need luck too. Ah, great, I cook it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, thank you very much for welcoming me. Thank you for the honor. I stand on all protocols. But before I even continue, I want to share one small gossip that happened today. As I was walking in, the entire world stood up. And I felt as if I had just become the excellency, the president, the governor, it was a good feeling. So those of you who have never ever felt it, please understand that it's very good when you walk in and everybody stands up. Unfortunately, you are standing up for the national line and not for me. <laughs> but I will remember the feeling. Since we are talking about the future, the future you, is the future you want, Abi? All right, so I have that picture in my head now that one day, I'm going to walk into a hall, maybe a stadium with, how many million people, sir? Yeah, a world stage. And when you walk in, everybody will stand up and you say, yes, that's a good picture. So thank you. I will remember that that happened to me first in Calabar. And I will tell the whole world that that's where I got it. But then, before I continue, we had some very, the, the, um, the convener, convener, my brother, my friend, he already gave us a keynote address. And so I'm wondering whether I really am going to give a keynote address because I don't know whether one can add on what he said. But he left us with some food for thought. And even though we might have been laughing about it and what he talked regarding democracy, it's really something very, very serious in our country today. And as he was speaking, I was taking some notes, and I was asking these same questions that he asked. I said, who are the idiots in the house? I didn't know he was going to ask it, because I, was going to, I wanted to know whether the audience I was going to be speaking to today are made up of idiots, made up of tribesmen, or made up of citizens. But let it not just pass over our heads. Spend the next few seconds just reflecting and being honest with yourselves. Because we can deceive people on the outside. Of course, when they ask for idiots, who put up their hands? Huh? Nobody. But do you honestly believe that this hall does not have at least one idiot? It has what? So there are many idiots in the hall. Now, the whole purpose of today is that by the time it ends, how many idiots should we have? None. Now, do we have tribesmen? Probably more tribesmen than you have idiots, right? 
So what's the purpose of today? That by the time you end, how many tribesmen should you have? Okay, that would be great. Now, do we have citizens in the house? Hmm. Are they new citizens or citizens in the last five minutes or real citizens? Now, would they be the majority in the house? Very good silence. And that's what I want us to think about. Because truly, if our society, of which this hall here is a sub-segment sub of what the true society of Nigeria is, if our society was made up of a majority of citizens, we would not be where we are today. So we know, and your silence answers it, we know that we are not a nation of citizens. We are not a whole field with citizens. We are not a people that have understood the value of being citizens. And we see the consequence of it. We live it every day. It's part and parcel of why we suffer, why we hunger, why we feel a room like this to hear lessons on leadership. So what's our challenge by the end of today? That challenge is that we must live here fully believing that we have the potential to become true citizens, true citizens for whatever it's worth. As we go into the topic of today, yesterday my goddaughter was graduating from Corona School, Bagada. Now, Corona also happens to be my alma mater. But while I was in the hall, much like this, and they were graduating, on the wall, there were certain quotations that they had put up there. And I saw one of those quotations. Now, the quotation said, it went something like this, always have the end in mind, have the end in sight. Now, it wasn't the quotation in itself it wasn't the quotation in itself that was the issue. Yes, it's something we know, something that you hear. But what was the issue was where it was. It was put in a primary school of people who were from nursery all the way to primary six. The oldest child that will be leaving primary six would be what, 10, 11, thereabouts. And every day you go into the hall and you see a quotation that says, have the end in mind, always. And so I sat down there and I began to imagine that what would this do for the mindset of future leaders if the decisions that they have to take on a day-to-day -day basis is based on knowing that you must weigh the consequence of the end and the decisions you take. What does it mean? It's a simple issue of cause and effect, action and consequences, of weighing the cost of whatever it is that you decide to do, whatever you decide to do, why? Because whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, every action has a consequence. And every consequence has a price. And that price will be paid, whether in this world or in the world to come. The issue, and going back to the three types of human beings, whether your choice in life is to leave that of an idiot, that of a tribesman, or that of a citizen. The issue is that you must determine whether you are willing to pay the price for the consequence that your actions will generate. Are you willing to pay the price? Now, when you determine if you are willing to pay the price, then please, by all means, go out and just enjoy fully 
whether your decision is to do right or to do wrong. Because the price will be paid. And so, in our decision of leadership, in our decision as to where we're going to go, there's no point being in the middle. If you're going to be a criminal, please be the biggest, baddest criminal ever. There's no point being in the middle. Becoming famous, let them know you as a bad guy, bad criminal. So that your name will last even after you have gone. But you will be known for criminality. I think in, when, in the 70s, I was young then. Some of you are not born. But there was a criminal then. I think his name was what? Oyenusi? Eh? Oyenusi, right? Eh? Oyenusi. Bad criminal. 70s. I think he was executed, right? Eh? He paid the price. He's long dead. But some of us still remember his name. If you want to be a criminal, please just be a bad one. Don't be a common criminal. You come, die, nobody even knows that you did anything. <laughs> There's no point. But likewise, if you decide that you want to make a difference, then please do something that you would also be remembered for. Don't be a dash. Born this day, die that day. Born this day, die that day. No. Be something. In growing up, some of us were a bit on the troublesome side. Stubborn. They used to beat us. Every decision that you took as a child. You know, we don't beat children these days, but for some of us, we received cane. But you knew that if you are going to do something for which you are going to be caned for, and you knew that they were already going to catch you because it was already too late, and that crime is already ongoing, then you had two choices. Either you decide that, you know what, since I'm going to get the cane, let me enjoy whatever I'm doing to the full. So that when I will be caned, I know that I am not losing on both sides. Does anybody feel me? So make up your mind. It's a mindset thing. Make up your mind early that whatsoever you are going to do, whatever your hands find to do, you do. Is it in the Bible? Did it say only the good things? What does it say? What does it say? Understand it. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it well. Why? Because there is a price to pay. There is a price to pay. But you must understand what that price is. You must know. If what you are going to do is good, do it very well. So that when the reward comes, anybody can say whatever they like. You know that that reward, you end it. Likewise, if you want to do wrong, please do it. So that when the price comes, you know that you have destroyed your name. You know that you are totally dead. You know that your children will never have anything good. But you know that you are a what? An idiot. And that you have been the best idiot that ever lived. But you know, it's for you. You alone, nobody, you don't care about anybody. You chopped alone. Your children don't matter. What happens to them does not matter. It's not, their, it's not your business. They sent two of an account together. But you know that this is for you. Understand the consequence. There is a consequence. Now, why is it important? We're in a leadership program. We're talking about good leaders. We're talking about the future you want. And here I am telling you that if you want to do bad, better do it well. But why? Simple. There's a cardinal principle for all great leaders. Anybody who is going to be an exceptional leader must do certain things. You must consider all sides, all sides 
of a matter. Before you make a decision, and when they make that decision, they will stand by their decision no matter what. Every great leader, every extraordinary leader will consider what? Will consider what? How many sides? All sides. And then they will do what? They will make a decision. They will make a decision. And after they make that decision, what will they do? Huh? They will stand by their decision. Again, every good leader will do what? They will consider. Then they will do what? Please, I need to hear you. They will make a decision. And then they will do what? Stand by the decision. It's very important. It's important. And why these three things? Very often we make decisions and the decisions we make are hasty. Even the wisest person, the most intelligent person, those ones that we were not, those ones that came first class, you know me too, I didn't, I followed uh, yoga. We were not first class people. But I pass him small, but we are not first class. However, no matter how intelligent you are, if you take only one person's argument, one side of the argument, and you make a decision on one person's viewpoint of that argument, are you likely to be right? Are you likely to be wrong? It's a 50-50 thing. You will just be as right as you are wrong. No matter what. So you must consider multiple sides of it. But this leads to certain things that you must open yourself to immediately. One, in considering all sides, you must understand that relationships matter. Why are relationships important? Relationships bring information to you. Relationships enables you to get multiple sources of information that you need to make the decision that you are going to take. Relationship is key. In considering all sides, every great and extraordinary leader is a leader that understands the value of relationships. Build your relationships. They matter. You never know where your relationships will take you. We met only 30 years ago. When we did, nobody knew where we were going. He didn't know, neither did I, that I was going to get into politics. He didn't know that he was going to end up working for my father. My partner ended up working for him. We didn't know. The reason why I'm standing here today talking to you is because of a relationship that was built many years ago. <laughs> Number two, networks. Every extraordinary great leader understands what it means to build networks. Build a network. Build a network. And why is that important? There's a saying that I came across that says that the size of your network, the quality of your network, will determine the size of your net worth and the quality of your net worth. And there's an experiment, something I read somewhere, and I started thought about it very, very simple. And I would try it here because I think it's simple for you to understand. I like to test experiments. And it's something called six degrees of separation. Anybody knows it? Has anyone heard what six degrees of separation is? Huh? If you know it, let me see your hands. Okay, great. So you will learn something today. Six degrees of separation is a simple theory that tells you that no matter who it is in the world that you want to meet, that person is only six steps away. Six people, six connections. Anybody in this world. Spend a minute to think about what I just said. 
anyone that you want to meet in this world is six people away from you. Okay? Let me put it another way. The gateway to your destiny, your breakthrough is six people away. Maximum. Okay? Now let's experiment. Who believes that? Okay, great. Nobody, so let us try. Who is the most difficult person that you believe today? Most difficult person that you believe today that if you wanted to meet that person, it's impossible for you to meet or nearly impossible? Uh, name? Me, right? That's one. But I need you to go higher. I'm already here. Buhari? Trump? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, wait, wait. It's an experiment I want us to follow because it's very important and it's going to change your lives. I heard Buhari. I heard Trump, Abi. Oh, no problem. Bill Gates. All right. So I have three people I can use. I have President Buhari. I have Trump. I have Bill Gates. Not so. Three. All right. So let us start... International or local? Which one should we start? Local. All right. Local. So, President Buhari. So, somebody wants to meet President Buhari in this room, has never met Buhari, does not know how he's going to find him. Right? What's the first step? Who is the first person that they can meet? The person is already in this room. Who is the founder? How many people does it need, do you need to meet the founder? You're in the room already. Yeah? Okay. So the founder is here already. That's one step. How many steps does it take for him to meet Buhari? For your founder to meet Buhari? One step. So between you and Buhari, how many steps are that? Two. Two steps. Understand it. He's here already. All it takes is one, two. If you don't think you can reach him directly, you have somebody who is between you and him. Whether it's your group lead, whether it's somebody between you and him. So maximum three. All right. Does that solve that problem of Buhari? Okay. It solves it. Follow. Because if you don't follow this, you will miss a life lesson. You miss a life lesson. That's Buhari. You mentioned Bill Gates. Bill Gates, right? Okay. So Bill Gates is there. Starting from this room, who can, meet, who can you reach to get Bill Gates? Okay, let's start with me. That's one step. Who else? After me, who do I need to get to Bill Gates? I need Dangote. Do I know Dangote directly? Okay, so that's two steps. I know him directly, so that's two steps. Between Dangote and Bill Gates? Yeah? One step. So how many steps? Three steps. Three steps. Then we mentioned Trump, Abbey. All right, so Trump. So we want to get to Trump. Start from this room. The founder, one. Who does the founder need? Buhari, two. Who does Buhari need? Eh? Who does Buhari need? Direct, three. So how many steps? Do you begin to understand? Do you begin to understand? Networks. Now, I said the size of your network, but then I mentioned something else after. I, huh? Quality. The quality of your network. Now, where does quality come in? You just walk up to him, and you say, I want to meet Buhari. Will he introduce you? Why? He doesn't know you. He has no idea who you are. It's extremely important that you build your quality. Whoever stands and introduces you is standing for you. So when you mess up your relationship, what are you messing up? You're messing up where you what? Your network. 
if you mess up your relationship, you mess up your network. And that's why relationships are critical. Critical. I came because of a relationship. The network was one step. If I had messed up my relationship with him, will he call me? Will he call me? All right. So network. Next, you have to have the ability to listen. You are trying to make decisions. But you must listen. Every extraordinary leader listens more than they talk. God does not make mistakes. He gave us two ears and one mouth, telling us that we need double to hear than we need to speak. Anybody who speaks more than they listen, you are not what? You are not a leader. Understand it. Simple terms. So when you find that you are the one that is always talking, 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 check yourself. You are more in the category of idiot than you are in the category of citizen. Very serious. Serious. So what are some lessons that we do? You get into a meeting. Speak last. Hold your tongue. You will have something to say. Bite it. Wait. Discipline yourself. Let others speak. Gather your thoughts. And when you open your mouth, make sure that what you say is to the point, it makes sense, and it's short. Don't go round and round and round. Now there's something called the elevator pitch. You must teach yourselves these things for leadership. Who knows what an elevator pitch is? Okay. All right. So, your elevator pitch is this. Somebody who wants to meet Dangote? Anybody? Okay, good. All right. So, let me use an example of somebody in this room here. So, I'm here today, right? Okay. How many people know what I do? You have an idea? At least you know I'm in the oil industry, right? Okay, good. And your guy has sold me out, said that I fly private sometimes. <laughs> All right? So that's good. Your elevator pitch is this. If you have the opportunity to tell me something, and we're in an elevator, and you meet me, how long do you have to say what you have to say? Huh? Ten seconds. Okay. Most likely, the longest period of time you are going to have, longest, is three minutes. The longest period of time you are going to have to hold the attention of anybody that you have never met, that you have been waiting to meet, is three minutes. In three minutes, what should you deliver? You should deliver what is the most important thing that you have been waiting for. You must know it. Now, what happens? So they come and they see you. Ah, okay, well done, sir. In fact, I've been looking for you, sir. One minute has gone. Oh, sir, if only I can see you. Ah, but you are here. I have something, I've been looking to tell you something. Say what you have to say. Many people lose their opportunity because they have not planned what they have to say. Have your communication. Deliver exactly what it is that you have come to say and deliver it in that period of time. Say something that will make you memorable. How many people are in this hall? Say there's an overflow. It's about... 2,000? 1,000? Huh? 3? 
thousand or hundred. So you have three thousand five hundred people here. Three thousand five hundred people. How many people do you think anybody can remember what you have to say to them? So you go through any of your speakers, leaders, anyone. A hundred people are going to come and meet them to tell them something about whatever it is that they want to do. What makes yours different? Why should I remember you and not the other person? Remember that. Think about what is going to make you different. What is going to make your pitch different? Why should I remember you out of 3,500 people? Remember. Consider all parts. Let me jump to making a decision. Then you must make a decision. I think it was Barangida that said that it's better to make any decision than make no decision at all. To an extent, I agree. No decision is evil. When you don't make any decision at all, it's actually evil. It's a problem. You create poverty, you create indecision, you slow everything down, you create havoc. So no decision is not a good place. But any decision as well is a problem if you make just any kind of decision. So you have to be ready to make great decisions. But it follows with the first aspect of it. So you must be a decision maker. But for those who make decisions, what do they have to do? One, they have to overcome fear. Why do people not make decisions? They're afraid. So you must be comfortable with fear. What did I say? Be comfortable with fear. Fear is okay. What did I say? Fear is okay. It's okay. It doesn't make you weak. It's okay. If you are not afraid, I'm afraid of you. If you are about to make a decision and you are not afraid, I am afraid of you, I will not stand with you. You should be afraid, yes, it's okay. But face it and overcome it. So overcome fear, it's fine. Have a plan. Take a decision. It's okay. Take a decision. In making a decision, what are you doing? You are weighing the consequence of that decision. And that's why you are afraid. Because sometimes the consequence seems big. And it's okay. But wait and make your decision. Now the third part of it is the hardest. The majority of people will make a decision and then they will run away and blame everybody else. It wasn't my fault. It's my teacher that failed me. It's not my fault. Is that wicked governor? It's not my fault. It's my boss. It's not my fault. It's ah uh ah, -uh, no, please. Once you have taken the decision, whose fault is it? PDP's fault. <laughs> Once you have taken the decision, it's nobody's fault again. From the minute that decision is taken. Whose responsibility does it become? Yours. Yours. That is leadership. The minute you take the decision, stand by it. Stand. Stand. Yesterday, a friend of mine turned 50, and we were at her birthday last night. And there was a gospel musician. I'd never, I'd never met him before. I knew he, I, when he was singing, I knew his songs, but I'd never met him before. And I heard his name for the first time. I think it was Padam Percy Paul. Padam Percy Paul. He had a lot I didn't know. I heard a lot of his songs. I never attributed it to him. But as he was ministering, and he was testifying, he testified about various aspects of his life. But two stuck to mind, but I'll share one. And it was one that he had just written a song on regarding one of the girls that was kidnapped called Leah. We know the story. But why did it touch him? And why was it something that he shared that is pertinent for today? 
How many girls were kidnapped with her? Over a hundred thereabouts? Most of them were released, except her. And when asked the question, that why was she not released? The answer that came back is food for thought. What was the answer? That she refused to give up her faith. She had made a decision that she was going to stand on what she believed. Your decision can cost you. That is why people are afraid of decisions. But when you make your decision, it can cost your life. Your decision can cost you your freedom. Your decision can cost you many things. It can cause separation from your family. Decisions, nobody said it's easy. But you want to lead. You want to be an extraordinary leader. You want people to be inspired to follow you into doing extraordinary things. Stand. Stand. That is what will make your name remembered. Please, who are the, what, can you get, give me one name? Two names of the girls that were kidnapped with Leah and released. Anybody? Anybody? So why do you remember her name? She stood. She stood. You want to be remembered? Stand. You want to be remembered when you have made your decision? Stand. Stand by it. That's what people respect. That's what they remember. That's what they would follow. Stand. Stand by it. If not, you become a dash in a tombstone. Nothing. Born this day, die that day. And so we get into what does it take to stand? What does it take? What does it take to stand? What does it take for you to stand out? The truth is that it's you. It's a very personal thing. We talked about good governance, something I'm meant to talk about. But when we talk about good governance, it is not about you standing aside and governing others and telling them that they should be good. Jesus criticized that. He said it was you asking people to do things that you cannot do, that the Pharisees will give a yoke and put it on the people, a big burden that they themselves cannot do. No. Good governance is about you. It's about the boundaries that you put around yourself and you say, this is a line that you will not cross. What are those decisions that you will not cross? It's not about your position, your education. No, no, no. It's not about whether you went to the right school, wrong school, whether you were educated or not. No, at all. I'm not saying education is not good. In fact, it's very good. I'm not saying that there are not good schools and bad schools. No, that's not what. But that is not what governance is. I know people who went to the best universities in the world, the best in Nigeria, they're the biggest criminals ever. I know professors, PhDs, generals, I know lawyers, sons, all doctors, everything with the biggest title. You cannot leave 10 Naira in front of them, you will disappear. So understand it. That governance, good governance, has nothing to do with education. It has everything to do with your moral boundaries. Your moral boundaries. What is acceptable to you? What line will you say that this one, thus far, but no more? This one, I can't cross. If you don't have boundaries, I'm sorry for you. If you don't have boundaries, I guarantee you 100% you will steal. Guarantee. The first day you enter into office, first day, 
some business person is going to come with the a bag and drop on your table and you open the bag and there will be more money than you have ever seen before and you will remember all the problems that you have you know all those your uncles that you have to pay for their hospital bill children that you must pay school fees for all you will remember all of them and guess what you will do you will justify it you will justify it what are your boundaries the president once said to me that there is nobody that can corrupt you huh? except you allow it first and secondly that if anybody is going to corrupt you the first person to do so will be who? not yourself I've already said you you want to be corrupted who has access to you? Huh? Your friends? You know, forget advisors. Your wife is what? Your family. <laughs> Say it's your boss. <laughs> <laughs> but think about this because it's important in your future leadership journey. There are two people that have access to you. Your very close friends and your family. They are the ones that have access to you. And they are the ones that can come and sit you down and say, ah, bros, our time don't come more. It is now our time. I cannot approach somebody that I have never met without knowing how his reaction would be. And go and give him something that can throw me in jail. I need to go to, with somebody. And so that president said, and this is the decision that you need to make if you are going to go into a leadership position, that the first example that you are ever going to set for anybody to know whether you are serious or not is with who? Your family. So the question that you must ask yourself is that are you ready to throw your family into jail? Your brother, your sister, your wife, your mother, your father, because they have come to corrupt you. Did I say the decision is easy? Huh? It's not easy. But it's something that must be done. It's not about education, it's not about birth, it's not about your, about your social status. Some believe that when you are born with a silver spoon, automatically, it means that your leadership status is guaranteed. It's not. You know that already. King David, Solomon, by the time he got to his grandchild, Rehoboam, the whole kingdom was scattered. The leadership went down. Let me round up. For good governance of yourself, there are certain things you must do. You must have faith. Faith in God that you have a divine purpose. Because when you mess up your divine purpose, why you are called, then you have a bigger problem. So have faith. There is a God. You have a purpose, that purpose in your life, you must defend. Two, you must know yourself. Know who you are. Discover yourself. I'm so happy that there are so many of you here today coming into this place to hear from people and their experiences because in comparing them, in hearing all of that, you begin to look at yourself, using them as a mirror to begin to discover who you are, what your purpose is. And going back again to knowing where in that category, tribesmen, idiot, or idiot tribesmen, and citizen, you fall. Know yourself. Know who you are. Very important. Know yourself. 
Then believe in yourself. Let nobody, no one, ever tell you that you cannot achieve anything that you put your mind to. I'm a living example of it. Do not believe it. There's something in my company with my partners and I, there's something that if you want us to just come after, if you want us to do anything, just tell us that this thing they say is impossible for a black man, it's impossible for you to do it. As soon as we hear it, uh, that's the end. The minute we hear that you say it's impossible for us to do it, we will do it. There's nothing that is impossible. Nothing. There was a time they told us, in this country, they told us, here, this country, they said that if Nigerians should touch crude oil, Nigerians here, yeah, that we don't have any sense in how to manage crude oil. I was told by my, in my face. They said, okay. We'll be the biggest lifter of Nigerian crude to prove that it can be done. They said we didn't have the sense as black people to raise money enough for you to finance such projects. It was impossible. We don't have sense, us, Nigerians, you don't have sense? How dare they? They're one of the most intelligent people I know on earth. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I said, have your boundaries that you won't cross. Set each day out to make an impact. Every single day. Determine that you must make a difference. Make a difference. No matter how small. No matter how small. Make a difference in somebody's life. Impact someone. Miles Monroe preached one day. I was sitting down in the crowd and I heard him mention something called dying empty. And when he talked about dying empty, it lit a bulb in my heart. And I determined that I will do it. And essentially, what does it mean? It means that everything that God deposited, has deposited in you is not for you, but is for someone else. And that when you keep it in, you are depriving people from what it is that they need for them to excel. And so pour it out, whether in songs, whether in writing, whether in teaching, whether in helping, whatever it is in your service, give that service out. Do it. Pour it out. But that the day you go to your grave, know that everything that you have in you, you've poured out. You know where the challenge is with that? This is what I found. The more you empty yourself, what happens? Eh? You are replenished. As soon as you empty yourself, God just deposits more. And then you empty, and more comes in. Then you empty. But for those who don't empty at all, what happens? There's no space to come in. So the prayer is that the day you have emptied, then God says, okay, it's enough, come home. But you know that at that point you have fulfilled your work. And remain humble. No matter what you do, humility is the key. No matter how high you go, the higher you go, please, the less you must be. Humility is the key. Have you ever seen and felt when somebody comes into a room that you are there and the person comes and you know that this person feels too much about themselves? You know, you know some people walk into a room with an aura that says that everybody in this room is nothing, that pay attention to me, all of you are just idiots, sit down, let me come in. How do you feel when such a person walks in? Repulsive. You are pushing such a way. That's what pride does. So when you come in with that, as a human being, you're already feeling that this person, I cannot stay in the same space with such a person. Essentially, you begin to fight God himself. Stay humble. What does humility do? 
it opens more doors for you than you can ever believe. There are people who will defend you without you even being there. There are people who will call you and give you things. Jobs, contracts, offers, possibilities, all sorts of things. Because they just know that you are not going to load it over them. Humility is the master key. Use it. Use it well. And so, every day, without fail, there are five things that I set out to do. There are five things I complete doing. These are my five. I don't know what your five would be, but these are my five. So one, I impact a life every single day. It doesn't matter. Even if I have to just get you to smile. I know that just making you feel better about yourself, I have lifted you up. That's the least I can do. But I cannot go to sleep if I have not impacted one person, at least one life. Number two, I must influence the next generation every day. I must find somebody who is from another generation, the next generation to impact. I hope I've done that today already. So I fulfill that. Number three, I must be a solution and never a problem. I make sure that I'm not a problem that day. I must provide a solution to something, somewhere, somehow. I pour myself out every day so that I die empty. And number five, I remain humble in every single thing I do. It's five. Impact a, day, impact a life a day, influence the next generation, be the solution, die empty, and stay humble. God bless you. Can we put our hands together for the keynote speaker, Mr. Tonya Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole. Consider all sides, make a decision, and stand by it. When the interpreter was trying to, he kept doing this. And I thought that that was the best interpretation of standing by it. We're going to take questions now. We'll take questions. Do you have a question? You are sure you have a question? A well thought out question. Okay, can I see your hand? Okay, nobody on this side. This side, any question? There's a man behind. You have like a white pen. You, can you please stand? Please come very quickly to the microphone. Gallery, any question? And why I'm asking you to come up is so that you can, we can see your face and you can stand by your question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hide. Someone wrote a note to me. I just asked him to come as well so he can stand by his question. O to Ben, Faculty of Law, University of Calabar. Please join them. One minute. All right. Um, my name is Otto Wambili. My question is this, sir. You said be the last person to speak in a meeting. That is listening and be the last. Now my question is, if everybody wants to be the last to speak in a meeting, who will be the first to speak? And will, does it mean that the meeting will not finish that day? Because everybody will be waiting to speak. All right, thank you. We'll take all the questions together, Mr. Cole, so you can um, address them. Thank you. Can we put our hands together for him? Very good question. If we're all waiting for each other to speak, who goes first? Next. I think the gentleman in the gallery is still. So I'll go round again. Just. Okay, please, please come up. I want oh, to ban you. Please ask your question. And then I want uh, three persons from Hall 2. No, no, no. This is more than. Please go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, Okay, my name is Emmanuel, Emmanuel Atta. How do you surmount some of the challenges there are in getting to leadership position? Because it's not all philosophical. It's not all philosophical. I give you an example, please. Let me just give an example. 30 seconds. Yes. I was involved in school politics many years back. 
at the departmental level. It was cool, nothing unopposed, and it was cool. But when I decided to go into the SUG, a friend of mine called me and told me, Manuel, you are a good person, just it's not for you. And when I insisted, he said, okay, come for a meeting. And I went for a meeting in a place that I pray my leg will never touch a place like that again. And they told me, this is what you will do. You will bring goods to this family. You will come to this jungle. You will bring goods for this family. You will come to this jungle. Okay, okay. And I was like, <laughs> I was just a humble boy that the father sends 10,000 naira a month to eat in school. So how, how do you surmount that kind of challenge? All right, thank you, Emmanuel. Can we put our hands together for him? Um, next question. And then O to Ben, then the other the three persons from Hall to please hold on. We have a different assignment for you. Okay. Your name and your question, please. Um Priscilla Ololo, I'm a cool tight. All right, I want to ask a question. Our speaker said we should do more of listening than talking. And I want to ask if you keep listening and you fail to talk, aren't you how will you be able to reach out or give out what you have in you? So that's my question. Okay, thank you. Did our speaker say you should listen and not talk? Okay, but he, he would answer that. Um, Otu Ben, your question, then the last three from home. My, my name is Otu Ben from the Faculty of Law, University of Calabar. My question is, with the influence of politics of Godfatherism in the present political dispensation, what are the necessary steps the youth must take to make sure that visionary leaders are saddled with a mandate? Thank you, Otu. Sir, did you get that? Okay, the last three people from Hall 2, um, it's my usual practice, we must take energizers. So the three of you are stuck in an elevator with Mr. Cole. In one minute, and I need more than one person to time you, in one minute, I want you to pitch yourself to Mr. Cole. In one minute, three of you will take your elevator pitches and then you answer the questions. You, are you interested in this exercise? Do you think they should do this exercise? They are not ready. You see, you see part of the challenge. They are not ready. Are you interested in this exercise or you just want to ask your question and go back to your seat? You are, you are all interested. Please, can we put our hands together for them? Let's encourage them. It's not easy. Do you want to take a, a deep breath whilst he answers the questions, then we come back to you, or you want to go straight into it? Okay, so we'll give you, he says to give you some time to think properly about your pitch. He'll answer the three questions and then we'll take the elevator pitches from you. This sounds like it should be fun. It's a good one. Very good. So good questions. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, in every society, uh, I go back to the fact that you would always find three types of people. Okay, remember it. You would always find three. You will. There's a, book I'm, there's a book I, I'm reading right now, um, and it says Business Secrets from the Bible. It's by a Jewish rabbi uh, called uh, Rabbi Lam Lamin, Lamim. Anyway, I'll find it and give it to you at the end. Now, one of the things that he said is that over time, there are certain things that will remain the same throughout time. It doesn't matter whether the education has, is whether you're in digital, whether you're in analog, it doesn't matter. Certain things would always remain true. Human character will be true. The character of a human being will remain the same. So you will get into the meeting and you will find somebody who will talk more. You will always find. Please don't be that person. You will find people who will be in the meeting that will just waste everybody's time. Do not be. Don't. So decide who you want to be and decide that you are going to be the one that will speak last to the end, towards the end. They're around, the meetings are around. So they will ask everybody who wants to speak first. Somebody will get up and say that he wants to speak first. Just be patient. Hold your tongue. It's a discipline. It's not easy. Because we like to hear our voices. So it's not easy. But learn the discipline. So remember that in a meeting you will find all sorts of people. Decide which type of person you want to be in that meeting. That's what I'm saying. 
Emmanuel, how do you surmount challenges? There will always be challenges. There will be challenges. But not all challenges are your challenges to bear. So you go, to a, you go for a, a leadership meeting and they tell you to go and do a sacrifice to a God. Where are your boundaries? Where are your boundaries? So if your boundary says that this is not what I want to do, then please go and influence elsewhere. There are areas where you can influence where if this is not yours, it's not yours. But if you want to jump over eggs, uh, kill one chicken, drink blood and all of that, because that's your bound, you have no boundary, you think that that's your own leadership call. Then, like I said, anything you want to do, please make sure that you are the witchcraft head in that place. If that's what you want to do, and pay the consequence there. But please have your boundary. Have your boundary. And stand, the day you decide that this is not what I want to do, I'm not going to do this, then stand against it and stand for something else that you know you can make a difference. And everybody has an area in life, a calling that they can make a difference. Emmanuel, find where you can make a difference. More listening than talking. I didn't say you shouldn't talk. Eh? The Bible says that... <laughs> Even a fool, when he remains quiet completely, never talks, seems wise, until they open their mouth. So please, be quiet. But you have to open your mouth. So that you are differentiated from not being a fool, what should you do? Be intelligent. So when you speak, speak with wisdom. And make a difference. So, a young lady... I didn't say don't speak. I said listen more than you speak. Godfatherism, what steps should you take? You know, Godfatherism is totally abused. There's something called mentorship and there's something called Godfatherism. Okay? Now, what you need to look for are mentors, not Godfathers. Just look for mentors. The whole term as to how Godfathers came about and all was really an issue of mentors. But... Where it now ended up was that it ended, and I think uh, your founder said it at the beginning, where he said that the older generation is finding themselves more in tribes, and that's what Godfatherism is about. It's about being uh, tribal. It's about me and all. Totally wrong. So as a generation, how do you do it? And this is this way it becomes interesting. There are more people, more of you, that have absolutely no interest in politics than those who have more. So there are more of you that can actually make a stand against Godfatherism if you decide that you want to come together to fight it. But you have to make a decision and you have to decide what you want to do. In any election that you have, any election within this state, any election, you're going to find out that it's only in fact, I think the numbers are somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of eligible voters of their age that come out to vote at all. Now, if 30% are making a decision for all of you that are sitting down and choosing that are because as Godfathers, you're not going to get involved, eh? you see where the problem is? So you need to mobilize. You can actually vote out the Godfathers. You can actually set out and make a difference. But you have to decide. You actually have more in number than them, but you are less united. So please come together. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole. So we'll take our pitches now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Patrick Agu. Uh, That's 30 seconds gone. Sir, I have uh, these uh, plans and ideas which I have mapped out. It's broad. I've made uh, you know, baby steps towards it. And uh, I want to find out from you as a successful person what would you advise me to do in seeing that I am currently feeling like what I'm doing doesn't Time matter? Next, please. Next. Can we encourage him? It, he didn't plan for it. No problem. And it's a good lesson. I love the fact that you're doing it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, sir. My name is Pius Oliver. So I have this fright of, this stage fright, like I have this fear of crowd of the crowd and I don't know I need maybe an advice of you 
that give you the admission to stand out in public and say what you want to say. Okay. One minute. That's done. Good afternoon, sir. Um, sir, I really desire your footsteps, sir. And I think um, I want to do... I want to they can't hear you. Face the door, I can't hear. You can adjust the mic. Okay. Uh, good, good, af good afternoon, sir. I... I can hear you. Go ahead. I really desire your footsteps, and I would love to beat your boundaries, so, sir. Can you please um, explain to me or give me guidelines on how to follow so that I can come out a better person in the future? Thank you, sir. All right. Can we put our hands together for them? <laughs> then we'll take feedback from Mr. Cook. <laughs> come. <laughs> All right. So we're we are back in school. Uh, uh, all right. So what did, what did he do right? What did he do wrong? So, huh? He did what? He didn't go straight to the point. All right, so that's one. So he didn't go straight to the point. Did he make a pitch or did he ask a question? He asked a question. At the end of the day, right, remember I'm in a crowded place and all that, so he just asked a question. There's no problem asking a question. The question that he asked, would it leave me inspired? Would it leave me better off? Am I better off for the question that he asked? Uh, so will I remember it? Okay, so that's the problem. So even an elevator pitch can be a question, but that question must leave the person that you are asking more intrigued about it so that you can ask a follow-up question and all. And that can keep my conversation. So that's where he had a problem. Do you understand? Uh, all right. Uh, who was the second one? Come. No, you are not the second. You are the last. You asked the second question. Okay. Okay, that's stage fright, man. Yeah. <laughs> what did he do right? Huh? Eh? He, he did what? He, he mentioned a problem. But he did, what was his problem? No, he had an idea. Abby? No, this is not, this is not stage fright. That's stage fright. Are you stage fright? This stage fright. Okay. So he has a problem. Now, do I remember the problem? Eh? I remember the problem. Why? Because it's interesting. Say stage fright. So I remember stage fright. What did he ask for? So he asked for advice and all of that. Okay. So I have stage fright and I have advice. Say good way because it's something that is different in other words you are almost opening yourself out to a vulnerability and if you study the person and you know the person that you are asking right that vulnerability leads them to say that okay maybe i can help you or not help you and the next thing you would then say you know what that's a number let me get in touch with you i'll figure out how to do it and all of that so might he get more attention from me than the other person all right or sympathy Okay, so his own elevator pitch was okay. All right. And did he do it in less than one minute? He went straight to the point. Stage fright. Okay. <laughs> All right. What did he do right? <laughs> okay. Do you remember what he said? Okay. So you don't even remember what he said. Uh, why are you running away? <laughs> they say stand by your st stand. Take your and stand, yeah. by it. stand by it. Stand by it. <laughs> so the young man says that he wants to walk in my footsteps. I think that's what he said. Yeah. Abby? That's what he said. All right. Now, what's the problem with that? In a crowded place and in an, an elevator where you have one minute and you say, I want to walk in your footsteps, what does he know about me? Eh? Nothing. I want to walk in your footsteps. You have no idea what my footsteps are. You desire my footsteps. You have no idea what my footsteps are. Okay? <laughs> so, there's a challenge to that. 
Then the next aspect of it is that many people will either say that or variations of that and all of that. And so what would happen in a crowded place in that kind of scenario is that that's very good. Thank you very much. God bless you. And you're gone. Okay? So it's a good, you, you desire something, but it's not enough for anyone to remember you to stand out. So a lot of people are going to come after and say something like, ah, please, can you mentor me? Can you do this? Ah, that's not the point. Too many people are asking the same thing. And so you're not going to stand out. So you need to be able to either find a keyword, like what? Stage fright. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole. One more time for our 2018 keynote speaker, Mr. Toyen Cole. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you to all those who asked questions, including Mr. Stage Fright.